From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, and here's what's coming up. K-State's Augustine Obur will report on his research into strategic tillage as a remedy for herbicide-resistant weeds in a no-till cropping system. Over several years, he's looked at the effects of a one-time mild tillage pass on crop yields, soil properties, and weed control. Then K-State's Jeff Whitworth alerts you grain sorghum and soybean growers about late-season insect pests that could still inflict costly damage on those respective crops. Further ahead, K-State's Charlie Lee looking at a recent study of crow consumption of waste human food during our weekly wildlife segment. Plus more right here on Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. Welcome to you. For this first segment, we're going to talk about a study that continues in the western part of Kansas. It involves no-till cropping systems and what happens when what is called strategic tillage is employed within those systems for specific purposes and how that impacts the uh, properties of the soil and uh, yields in dryland no-till systems. Joining us now is soil scientist for K-State, based at the Agricultural Research Center at Hayes, Augustine Obur. And right up front, Augustine, what is meant by strategic tillage? Uh, thank you, Eric. Strategic tillage, what I'm defining as strategic tillage, is a tillage operation that you do one time in a no-till system to correct certain problems that you have in your field. And after this one-time tillage operation, you let the field go back to no-till. A typical example is a herbicide-resistant weeds or perennial grasses like windmill grass that we cannot control. So we use the strategic tillage operation to control the windmill grass, and then we allow the field to go back to no-till. And the degree of tillage does matter here. In other words, if you're dealing with a herbicide-resistant weed, you're going to have to be somewhat aggressive with that one-time tillage, are you not? That is what we are trying to look at here. Uh, We now have a lot of issues with our no-till system, and a typical example is uh, the women grass that I mentioned out here that uh, for a couple of years into no-till, you begin to see these grasses pop up in the field that you cannot control. Fortunately for us, this is a very shallow rooted grass. So using a sweep plow, so that is what we did in this research. Just going one time using a sweep plow, we just go in one time tillage operation and till it very shallow to 15 centimeters, that will be six inches. But you can actually set it up at three inches and it will control the grass. Mm -hmm. So one time shallow tillage operation. As we get further into the particulars of the study, you conducted this at three different sites around western Kansas, yeah, right? Yeah, so what we did is on our long-term no-till crop rotation study that we have since 1976. We've seen this herbicide-resistant weeds pop up in the field, so we're trying to do the tillage operation to control that. And then we also have Another experiment that we started quite recently at three locations that we are calling that uh, occasional tillage because we are tilling every three years and every six years. So we have a site in Hayes, a site in Garden City, and another site in Tribune. So that we are calling that uh, occasional tillage because we till in a little bit more frequently than our long-term plot that we have tilled one time. And is this, Augustine, a typical wheat, sorghum, fallow rotation? Or yeah, we have 
quick sorghum fallow rotation. We have actually have the long term plus. We have five tillage operations. <laughs> we have a continuous wheat, wheat fallow, wheat sorghum fallow, and then continuous sorghum. So we have five different rotations that we have this experiment in. Well, let's talk about what things you're discovering to date here. And let's start with the impact on crop yields. Okay. In dry land system, the re- one of the reasons we go no-till is because you see the wind blows. Today is blowing very hard here. So if you till, typically, you have the topsoil blown off, <laughs> and that will reduce your soil quality. And then the other thing is also it takes out water from the soils, and that tends to affect your subsequent crop yields. So one thing that we did is after we tilled this plot in the summer, we measured soil water content, and we didn't see any significant difference between our one-time tillage operation versus our long-term no-till in terms of soil water content. And because of that, we didn't see any impact on our subsequent crop yields. So actually, we saw that uh, overall for the two years that we did this, if you average it together, the wheat yields from our strategic tillage plot was about five bushels per acre higher than our long-term no-till. Interesting. Uh, and that was very interesting. This is something that we are also seeing typically in some years. We see that our till plots, plots that we till before we plant wheat, they yield sometimes tends to be a little bit higher than our no-till. And we aren't seeing that much an impact on wheat yields when we till ahead of wheat compared to sorghum. And you did test out the impact on sorghum yields yeah, tilling we did ahead that of planting? Too. That one-time tillage operation did not affect our sorghum yields. But where we do tillage every three years or six years, we are seeing a decrease in sorghum yields. If you till ahead of sorghum, you have a yield drag. But we are still not seeing any impact on our wheat yields, which is very surprising. And I think it has to do with the tillage intensity. So we are doing uh, just one tillage pass ahead of wheat, and then we are also doing two tillage passes ahead of wheat, and we are not seeing any impact on the yield. So I think it has to do with the level of tillage. The other part of this was your interest in the ensuing impact on the composition of the soil, if you will, uh, how how those properties are impacted by this tillage. Yeah, so that is one thing that we are very concerned, that if you go ahead and till a long-term no-till field, are you going to lose all these benefits that has accrued over long-term use of no-till? So what we did was we measured, uh, typically we measured soil organic carbon, to see whether there will be any differences. And we didn't see any difference between our strategic till plus and then our long-term no-till in terms of soil carbon. One other thing I forgot to mention is we also have a treatment in there, which is long-term reduced tillage, where we till two to three times in the summer. So what we are seeing is our long-term no-till plus, the organic matter content is more than our reduced till plus. The reduced till plot, the tillage frequency is higher. So when you till more frequently, it can impact the soil organic carbon. But the one time uh, strategic tillage had no effect on the soil organic carbon. We also measured water stable aggregates in the soil. And interestingly, we did not see any difference between the strategic tillage and then the no till plots. So really, when you look at that in total, the conclusion to date seems to be that this one-time strategic tillage does not negatively impact that system, whereas if you do it more frequently, the damage, if you will, will start to accrue. Yes. So that is what we are finding out so far. So my recommendation is if you have these uh, herbicide-resistant weeds, uh, perennial grasses that you cannot control, then this one-time strategic tillage could be an option to control these weeds, and then you go back to no-till. And if you do that, our results show that at least we are not seeing any impact, the negative impacts that we were worried about, we are not seeing that so far. There's no effect on yields, 
And we are also not seeing any impact on the soil health parameters that we measured. The one thing that we also saw was we measured uh, nutrients and um, the strategic tillage actually saw a bump in soil nitrogen, that there was an increase in uh, nitrate nitrogen following the tillage of the long-term plots. So we are a little bit uh, bust in nitrogen mineralization with the tillage. And you intend to continue to look at this for some time. What's the next interest that you have in this, Augustine? Yeah, the next interest is we have measured this uh, for two years that we did it. So the other thing is what is the long-term implication of this tillage operation? And then the other question also is how long will this one-time tillage operation control the windmill grass? Mm -hmm. We are going to monitor this to see how frequent we have to do this tillage operation to control the grasses. And then we are also monitoring the subsequent impacts on the yield. So we are continuing to monitor yields. Um, next year will be the third year after we till the plots. So we will go ahead and measure the soil health parameters again to see whether we have lost any of the organic carbon or we build up the organic carbon just to see if there is any differences between the no-till where we left us long-term no-till versus where we tilled. Augustine, the best of luck in furthering this work. Many thanks to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Eric. And if anybody wants more information, we have this as part of our case study, our research of progress. Uh, we have three publications out there on our strategic tillage work and then our occasional tillage research. We're both the results from Hayes and that from Garden City and Tribune. If you'd like a starting point to seek that out, go to the agronomy website at K-State agronomy.ksu.edu. We've been speaking with Augustine Obur. Augustine is a soil scientist at K-State's Agricultural Research Center at Hayes, along with colleagues in Garden City and Tribune. He's been studying the impacts of strategic tillage on crop yields and soil properties in dryland no-till systems. We'll be back with more on this Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. This agriculture today continues now with a glance to what's happening in our crop fields as far as insect activity. And no, that has not slowed down that appreciably, even as we transition into fall now. Along with us is Jeff Whitworth once more, crop entomologist, K-State Research and Extension. Jeff, growers are anxious to finish off these crops, uh, and we're going to particularly center on sorghum and soybeans today. You're keeping a wary eye out for sugarcane aphids in sorghum right now. Yes. Uh, good morning, Gary. Sugarcane aphids. They've been in Kansas, oh, maybe for a month in the south, central, um, the southern parts of the state. But this week is the first that I found them in north central Kansas. And I'm finding sporadic small colonies. And what I'm worried about is if the weather continues to be relatively mild, because the sugarcane aphid is considered to be a subtropical or a tropical insect. They like warm weather. They do better in, in warm weather. If these fall conditions continue to be mild and humid, the sugarcane aphid is going to explode. I mean, there are a lot of beneficials out there. But as we get later into the year, uh, the beneficials will also start going away because they start looking for overwintering sites and it's just natural attrition takes its toll as we get into the fall. So those aphids could overtake the beneficials? The beneficials have been really good at helping to control aphids, especially sugarcane aphids. But this looks to me like it's setting up more like in 2015 when we started getting aphids in, but they didn't come in until late. And one of the problems with sugarcane aphids 
if they come in late, they still produce a lot of honeydew, and they'll feed right on the head, and that head can get saturated with the sticky honeydew, and then the leaves can get covered with uh, honeydew, and then there's a sooty mold that will grow on the honeydew. So it can be a real hassle. I've heard a lot of growers say, man, they don't want to go back through 2015, 2016. 2017, 2018, we had aphids, but for, I think, probably because of all the beneficials, they didn't amount to the problem that they were in 2015 and 2016. But this year, we're getting just about every sorghum field I've been in has a few of these aphids, and most of them are adult winged aphids, and those are the females that produce the colonies. So if you find a leaf, you'll find one adult aphid with three or four little tiny baby aphids there. And if a uh, beneficial lady beetle or green lacewing or something doesn't find those, there's no reason they won't just explode over the next two or three weeks and continue to feed on this aphid, and they will move up to the head. And like I said, if you're trying to, to harvest the head yet, they can junk it up pretty good with the stickiness of that honeydew. It just interferes with harvest. So producers need to be on the watch for the aphids, and the, if the numbers build up, that might warrant treatment? It, it, again, it depends on the stage of growth. If they get pretty bad, you know, we have some pretty good insecticides that do a really good job of helping to control sugarcane aphids. But I, I really think we ought to continue monitoring, get out at least once a week, especially in these late planter fields. Once it gets past the doe stage, you might get out and check this once a week just to make sure these aphid colonies aren't building up to the point where they might produce enough honeydew that it would interfere with harvest. Actually, once they start producing that much honeydew, it's really easily seen because it's highly visible. It's shiny, silky. Some guys say, you know, the leaves look silky or shiny because that's the honeydew, and the, the aphid colony be on the leaf above that where it's dripping down onto those leaves. So if those colonies build up to the point where they're the when you start walking through there and your shirt and your jeans <laughs> are getting sticky uh, yeah, and you're looking at harvesting that, you know, I would probably consider an application of an insecticide just because once the sugarcane aphids are gone, that honeydew stickiness is gone within three days. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. Also, heavy rains will wash it off um, and take care of the sooty mold that's there also. So just be aware of the situation. Get out and monitor these fields. That advice for those of you with late developing grain sorghum out there, the alert about possible sugarcane aphid issues. On soybeans, you say there are a couple of leaf feeders that you're watching closely as well, Jeff. Well, the bean leaf beetle is out and about, and they feed on the leaves of the late planted, the nice succulent green leaves. But then this time of year, they'll move up to the green pods, and they will feed on the pods. We've gone over the differences between earworms or soybean pod worms feeding versus adult bean leaf beetles before the bean leaf beetle will feed on the pod itself and they'll cause some scarring and the head worm or the pod worm or the corn ear worm whatever you want to call it they will feed right on the seed within the pod so the hole will be right there wherever the seed is and i have not seen much of that going on right now most of what i've seen feeding on the marketable product the pods are the adult bean leaf beetles and that's where you if you're out walking around you your pods are just now starting to turn a little bit brown or yellow you'll see the scarring you see white the underneath side of the pods showing up. That means you've had some bean leaf beetles feeding on it for the most part, and those are still around. But right now, the pods are getting far enough along that they're hard enough that they're protecting the seed inside. So I don't think the bean leaf beetle adults are going to cause much damage, especially in the conventionally planted fields. Now, maybe really late planted soybeans, they might if they're still setting pods, but there's not a lot of bean leaf beetles around. Also, the bean leaf beetles overwinters adults, so they're not going to feed too much more, at least I don't think, this year before they move out and they go to uh, CRP or overwintering sites in alfalfa or someplace else. So I don't think the adults are going to be a problem, but I've gotten a few calls that they are still around and they still are causing the white coloration on the pods. The other one that I've gotten quite a few calls about lately is the woolly bear caterpillar. The woolly bear caterpillar 
right now they're pretty large and they're highly visible because they're pretty large. Okay, <laughs> right. and they're woolly and uh, they catch your attention. They do catch your attention. <laughs> right now they seem to be on the move. Uh, they'll feed on the leaf tissue. I've never seen them feed on the pods or the beans within the pods, but they will feed on the leaf tissue, and they can do a pretty good job of defoliating. But right now they're pretty large. That means that most of the feeding damage is done, all right? So what we're seeing and what we will see for the next week or two is these highly visible white, yellow, orange, black, whatever, woolly bears crawling around on plants and crawling around on the ground because they overwinter as large, mature larvae. So you're going to see them heading for overwintering sites. And that always gets everybody excited. But uh, most of them won't make it through the winter. Most of them will die through the winter. So just because you see a lot of them in your field this year doesn't mean next spring there will be a big influx of woolly bears. Uh, survivorship is pretty low, really. But they do survive. And by the, this time, this is the second or the third generation. So now we're at the max, and they are highly visible. But I've never seen a case where – their feeding on soybeans justified treatment. I didn't say I've never seen them treated. <laughs> I just said I've never seen where it was justified on soybeans. Now, they just don't feed on the pods. Basically. They don't feed on this marketable product. No, I shouldn't say never, but they feed on the leaves. But most of it's done. But when they're this large size, their feeding's over with, they're heading for overwintering sites for the most part. So you're going to see a lot of them crossing the road or, you know, out on the ground by the plants and up on the plants crawling down. But I really don't think it's anything to worry about. But you do note that there is one pest in soybeans that as harvest time approaches, producers need to be wary of. That is stem borer activity, which could lead to plant lodging. Yes, uh, Dacty stem borers have been active uh, since mid-July. Their feeding has become noticeable probably three weeks ago in various fields because you start seeing the eggs are laid in the petioles and the, and the larva hatches and it feeds there and then it crawls its way, bores its way down to the base of the plant. So that's about where it is now. They were getting towards the base of the plant, one larva. But when they get to the base of the plant, they have this characteristic behavior of girdling around the interior of the plant. The plant won't fall over normally, but if you get a wind, it will. It will cause it to blow over. And there's no insecticide, systemic insecticide, or there's no management tactic that we've developed to prevent this. So I tell everybody, if you have dectes, if you start to see some of these petios turning brown early on, you've kind of been watching the progress, and you start to see a plant or two as they dry down fall over, and if you've seen a field that had pretty much uh, 80 to 90 percent lodging, it looks like pickup sticks. I mean, it's it's pretty discouraging, and it's really tough to harvest. Uh, so I really recommend if you have or if you think you have dectes infestations, 50 to 60 percent, you might want to try and harvest those fields first. Get those out of, out of the way before uh, any lodging does occur because as we start to get storms, uh, we get some winds through that lodging will occur more and more as the girdling occurs. And, and so just our only management strategy is to harvest as soon as you can all the fields that have dectes. All right. Well, the crop insect season may be winding down some, but it's hardly ground to a halt. So producers, be aware of all these possibilities, inspect your fields, and make sure to take the correct action if warranted. Appreciate the word, Jeff, as always. Thank you. Yes, my pleasure. Thank you, Eric. Jeff Whitworth, crop entomologist, K-State Research and Extension, our guest on this part of Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station.
Welcome back to Agriculture Today, coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University. Eric Atkinson here. And now for you, today's agricultural news headlines, these courtesy in part of DTN. Checking the latest on Kansas crop progress and conditions for the week ending this past Sunday, according to the weekly USDA report. Our topsoil moisture supplies in the state are at 6% surplus and 65% adequate, 29% short to very short. Subsoil moisture at 4% surplus and 73% adequate, 23% short to very short there. The winter wheat is planted to the tune of 30%. That's near the five-year average. Winter wheat emergence at 12%, again near the average. Corn mature now, 73%. That's behind the 84% average for the date. And the corn harvest is 28% in. That's fairly well behind the 41% average for this date. Soybeans dropping leaves at 44%, behind the 59% average. And the soybean harvest at 2% behind the 7% average. As for grain sorghum then, sorghum mature, 38%, that's behind the 49% average, and the grain sorghum harvest is 6% complete, that's behind the 11% average in Kansas. With the average freeze dates for much of the U.S. just weeks away now, less than half of the nation's corn crop and just over half of the beans have reached maturity as of Sunday, according to the USDA. Corn dented, estimated at 88 percent, that's 10 percent behind the five-year average. Forty-three percent of the corn estimated as mature, that's 30 percent behind the five-year average for the date. Nationwide corn harvest progress, 4 percent, progressed 4 percent, that is reaching 11 percent, and that's behind the five-year average of 19 percent. Soybeans dropping leaves at 55 percent as of Sunday, 21 percent behind the five-year average. And in the first soybean harvest report of the season, the USDA estimates that 7 percent of the crop was harvested. That's 13 percent behind the average. Winter wheat planting nationally, pulling slightly ahead of the average pace, 39 percent in as of Sunday, compared with 38 percent for the average. Winter wheat emergence at 11%, also near the average. And grain sorghum coloring nationally at 95%, that's right on the average. Sorghum mature for, uh, 54% behind the average of 63%. And the sorghum harvest nationally reaching 30% as of this past weekend. That's behind the five-year average of 35%. The USDA's September 1st Grain Stocks and Small Grain Summary released yesterday turned out to be a big surprise relative to the expectations on both corn and soybeans. The USDA's Gary Crawford takes a closer look. Monday's USDA stocks report shows smaller year-end stocks of corn and soybeans than most people expected. Of course, this is going to be uh, bullish. And it has been. USDA's Deputy Chief Economist Warren Preston, after the report came out, corn futures up 4 to 11 cents, beans 13 to 17 cents. Now, for corn, USDA has year-ending stocks September 1st at 2.1 billion bushels. Well below the lowest of the low industry estimates. And what's behind that? With corn, it looks like it's a disappearance story. Use of corn during the summer quarter just over 3 billion bushels. Now, yes, that is down 2% from last year, but it's still the second largest June to August disappearance on record. Now, for soybeans, we have record large stocks, 913 million bushels, more than double this time a year ago, but still... It's well below what industry was anticipating. Partly because use is stronger than expected, but also USDA reassessed the 2018 soybean crop, taking it down by 116 million bushels. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington. Now with Milk Lines, K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook. Mike? Today I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning some options that you might want to consider for the transition or pre-fresh diets that you feed on your dairy. You know, in recent years, a lot of us have started using a lot of straw in that diet that we feed to those cows three weeks prior to calving. And in general, those things work very well for us in trying to control some of the metabolic issues that we sometimes face in early lactation. However, there's some new research that you might want to take into consideration as you think about how you're feeding those animals. When we have these high straw diets, typically they're dry, and typically the dry matter content of those will be much more than 50%. So a recent study from 
University of Guelph has indicated that if we add water or reduce the dry matter content of the TMR to about 45%, we will actually reduce the sorting of the diet. This is very important because many times these diets are sorted to the point that many animals may not actually consume the amount of straw that they should. So adding moisture, and again, it can just be plain water, doesn't have to be anything fancy, will reduce the sorting of those diets. Another thing that they looked at was the chop length of the straw itself. You might find this interesting. So you took straw, they chopped one part of the straw through a one-inch screen and the other through a four-inch screen. The shorter chop straw through a one-inch screen, when they fed that to animals before freshening, they saw an increase in dry matter intake of about 1.3 pounds. They also observed the animals after calving. Those animals that were on the control diet are the ones that had the larger particle size, the ground through the four-inch screen, saw a decrease in dry matter intake after calving, and a larger decrease than what the animals fed the shorter chop straw. They also measured the ketone levels three weeks after calving and found that the animals on the longer particle size diet prior to calving had a much higher level of ketones. In other words, they may be more susceptible to metabolic diseases. So, what should we consider from this? Well, number one, again, if you're not adding water to that pre-fresh diet, likely you should spend some time talking to your nutritionist about that. Secondly, if you have particle sizes or pieces of straw that are more than an inch in length, probably means that the diet is maybe too long and we have an increase in sorting and a decrease in intake, which will cause us some issues after the animal calves. So again, talk to your nutritionist and evaluate whether or not you should be grinding that straw for these pre-fresh diets, a little smaller than maybe what you are today. Another interesting thing that was reported at the dairy science meetings this summer is that feeding rumen-protected choline three weeks prior to and three weeks after calving will increase energy-corrected milk and also increase intake both before and after calving. Important thing to note on this is that, yes, this is a feed additive, and yes, it does cost more, but the return on investment was about three to one. So for every dollar invested, about three dollars more was realized in milk income. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our dairy farmers to take a look at pre-fresh or transition diets for their dairy cows. Thanks, Mike. And this is Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. Ahead for you now, our weekly wildlife management segment on agriculture today. Charlie Lee, Mike Side, wildlife specialist, K-State Research and Extension. The topic we'll address this time around, Charlie, it's rather curious in, in the way it sounds anyway. We're going to look at cholesterol levels in crows. Now, there's a purpose for this and actually research behind it, but this has to do with crows and other wildlife feeding on food and other refuse out there. Yes, there are many wildlife species that have access to food that humans have provided. Sometimes that's an intentional provisioning. Sometimes it's things that they find unintentionally. Uh, We know that urban humans produce a lot more waste than rural folks. 21% of the municipal solid waste is food. That food goes somewhere, uh, and eventually wildlife have access to that. Uh, We always talk about wildlife habitat and what wildlife habitat is, and that includes cover, food, space, and water. But when we think about the food resources that we're providing, we often don't think about 
perhaps we're providing things that are not healthy choices. And what do wildlife do with those? We know that the human diet is changing, and it's changing wildlife as a result. Meat consumption, for example, is positively correlated with the degree of urbanization in, and the availability of fast food that's changed human diets on a global scale. I know there's studies that's looked at urban ants, and they have different isotopic signatures that are associated with processed foods than those ants, same species from rural areas. Uh, we know that house sparrows and San Joaquin kit foxes have higher cholesterol levels than those same type animals in other locations, uh, in rural locations. So this particular uh, project looked at urbanization and elevated cholesterol in American crows. And crows are voracious consumers of food refuse, right? I think most people would see crows uh, as consuming a lot of garbage, a lot of roadkill, certainly a very widely varying diet. So this particular project was done both at Davis, California, and also done in a separate and a New York population at Hamilton College. So we had UC Davis and Hamilton College both working on this. The, the study was set up to collect data from 140 crow nestlings from 66 crow nests in California, and then they collected nestling data from 86 crow nestlings from 29 nests in New York. They took blood samples to determine cholesterol levels and as well as did a body condition score for crows at both locations, as well as a supplemental experiment where they were deliberately feeding human food to crows under crow nests in New York. In that particular study, each group was provided with three cheeseburgers from McDonald's restaurants. Hmm. Uh, those three cheeseburgers were provided uh, five to six days per week. They were placed within 10 yards of the, of the nest. Those crows were supplemented from one to six weeks prior to the crow nestlings being banded. And, and it was quite interesting that the cholesterol certainly increased in those that had the extra provisioning from the cheeseburgers. So it's quite clear that that feeding on human food has had an impact on the nutritional makeup of those birds, but does that lead to adverse conditions for crows? Well, we know that those supplemental diets can have both positive and negative effects on wildlife. It can certainly buffer animals during times of food shortage. It can reduce the amount of time the animals spend looking for food. It can speed up the breeding process. It can improve body conditioning. But just like too much of a good thing in humans, it can also provide some negative impacts. I think most of the research that I've seen shows some benefit in uh, advancing the breeding, increased reproductive output, uh, but at the same time, it's going to increase some of the, the blood changes in, and hormonal changes uh, that perhaps need further study in order to really understand what the true impact of supplemental feeding wildlife will be. We might not think so much about this particular study as being kind of the, the one to end everything, <laughs> but keep in mind that there's a lot of people deliberately provide food for wildlife without giving a lot of thought to the choices. They're probably more interested in feeding something that attracts wildlife to the area without being aware that there could be negative connotations associated with that. So once again, it's an area of wildlife behavior and uh, human impacts that would probably deserve more study and, and likely will we'll see that happen. Well, I, I think there's something to be learned from this particular study. Need needs some more information on long-term uh, effect of crow survival. But certainly, if we could assume the, the cholesterol would act similarly in wildlife species as it does in humans, there's going to be some negative impacts as humans are providing supplemental food for wildlife. 
Crows certainly are a species that are going to be having access to lots of different food items. It's going to be fairly difficult to pin that down in a true free-range wild situation. But it's definitely worth consideration, and that is overall the impact of supplemental food on wildlife, and in this instance, the impact of that food being available to crows on their cholesterol levels. Charlie, thanks for sharing this word on this study. Charlie Lee, Wildlife Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. That is our time for today. Before we part, again, if you've not taken advantage of our podcast service, either for listening at your leisure or for automatic download to your mobile device, please visit this website, agtoday.net. The daily broadcast is loaded up right there immediately after it airs, and you can learn how to subscribe to the automatic download right there as well. So again, agtoday.net. Please look into that. In the meantime, we'll be right back here this same time tomorrow. Hope you will be as well. Until then, Eric Atkinson bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.